Hello, I am Jesse Weiler here with, with Mother Marie Ju Julie. Mother Marie, how, how are you doing this fine afternoon? Very good, thank you. It's beautiful well, I, here. I'm glad to hear it. Hear it. Mother Mother Marie is uh, she is, is a sister of charity of, of Our Lady, Mother of the Church. Church. Sorry, I pull that up on my screen. Green. It's a, a quite a mouthful. And uh, you've been a board member for a while for the Institute on Religious Life, so we have a lot to thank you for, you for that. And you're, and you're going to talk to us today about sheltering in place with the indwelling presence, which I thought was a very, very fascinating title. And I'm very excited to, to dive into this with you. But uh, first, you wanted to, to start off contrasting maybe what we thought about this shelter in place and maybe maybe what it actually turned out to be be so what so what was what was the transition for most of us like all right uh, before i begin to answer that question i just have to make a, a little disclaimer about a year ago i had a stroke jesse and um, it affected my speech and language and sometimes i have trouble finding the word i need or sometimes i stutter it's very unpredictable um, and once in a while in the middle of a sentence, I'll forget what I'm talking about. So it just just bear with me. It only takes a few seconds for my mind to get working again. Um, but it can be um, unnerving for a listener. So please just um, just be patient. Everything will be fine. Well, it if it does, I'll we'll, we'll so, say that it's a bad buffering process. We'll just blame it on, on te technology. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you. All right. Um, well, to answer your question, Jesse, I, I think that most of us thought that at the beginning, the sheltering in place was going to be a great thing for us. We'd have a chance to have meals together, sometimes three even. Um, we'd get to know each other. We'd have be able to play games together, um, watch movies and have popcorn together. Um, and find out really who each of us is to the other. That's what we hoped for. And I think that was a realistic um, expectation. But for some of us, as time went on, we found out that we were learning things about each other that we wish we didn't know. That um, we find quirks in one another that we had either overlooked or didn't know were there that we might have gotten begun to get short-tempered with each other because we're spending so much time. And I think by now, many of us, after eight or nine weeks of this, we're beginning to think, oh, when is this going to be over? And when can I get out and be with some other people? I think that's sort of a, a normal response. So for, from your experience, what is this like can we draw from the, from the monastic life that really inspires us or, or that, that we draw from to really aid us in this process? Well, I have a, a, a tale, I think, that is very um, representative of, of what's going on. It's an old story. It's been told in many different ways. I first heard it uh, in a book by M. Scott Peck. It's the story of an old monastery that was flourishing uh, outside a big city. And people used to come there to just drink in the wisdom of the monks because they were so kind and they reverenced each other and it made them feel better as they went back to their daily life. But then the spirit of the world got into the city and instead of taking their cues from the monks, they got more self-centered, um, materialism came in um, and they were more interested in what's good for me rather than what's good for my brother or sister. And unfortunately, that seeped into the monastery. And it came to a point where the, the monks in the monastery were beginning to experience the same things. And they lost their reverence for one another. And they were um, sort of each going their own way. And people recognized that. And so they stopped going. And some of the monks left, many of them left, and young men stopped coming to visit, asking to enter, until there were only five monks left. And in the woods near the monastery, there was a, a little hut where the holy rabbi of the city used to go for days of prayer and recollection. 
And the people and the monks knew when he was there because there'd be a little wisp of smoke coming up from the chimney. So the abbot, who was so concerned about what had happened to himself and the monks, said, I'm going to go visit him. So he went and he was welcomed warmly by the rabbi. And they talked for about two hours about the new culture, which was so devastating to the interior life. And they prayed together and they wept together. And just as the abbot was about to leave, he said, oh, what I really came for was to ask you some advice on how to get the spirit of reverence for one another back. And the rabbi said, mm, I don't have an answer for that, I'm afraid. You're going to have to work that out yourselves. But I, I do want to say this. Among you, one of you is the Messiah. And when he went back to the monastery, he told his brothers that. The rabbi says, one of us is the Messiah. So they all went to chapel and they began to think, well, it must be the abbot, he's our leader, but he sure can be bossy. And someone else thought, well, maybe it's Brother Benedict. You know, he makes such good meals, but uh, he falls asleep in chapel. Or maybe it's Brother Edward, who's so good with the sick, but I don't know, he can be kind of mean sometimes. And they kept thinking about it, and it occupied their mind day and night until little by little they began to say, well, I don't think it's me, so I just better be careful with all of the other brothers because one of them is the Messiah. That is an amazing, amazing story. There's so, so, there's so much uh, that I'm thinking about right now. There's so much that I think we can draw from that. Uh, I, I think I think those texts that you spoke of uh, immediately after after we discovered what this is, this is really really gonna like, we see a lot of that now with a lot of the infighting. Uh, I have to wear a mask when I go outside. Should I? Should I not? Uh, what what what's really important here? Is it my freedom? Is it it to care for others or consider consideration for others? And there's so much racing through my mind about that. And then also also just the idea of. I mean, I said, treat everybody like you'd want to treat yourself. But this this lesson to that even further, not just yourself, but how you would treat Christ well. So could you give us, us a couple of examples of how that indwelling presence, how we can help cultivate that and help that, that grow? Okay, right. Jesse, that's, that's well said. Um, I think as we become maybe suspicious of other people um, or anxious about other people or even angry, if we can remember that each of us was made in the presence of God, in the, in the image and likeness of God, then it's easier to begin to make excuses for the other person when he does something that I don't like or to be a little kinder to someone. I, I suppose he thinks, <clears throat> I think he, he thinks that way about me sometimes. And if we can recall from scripture, all the times that Jesus talked about living within us, you know, um, chapter 14 and 15 from the Last Supper, I just filled with, with images of that, when Jesus kept saying, remain in me as I remain in you. Um, open your door to me and uh, let, me, let me be part of your life. If he's saying that to me, then he's saying that to everyone else. And Paul says in Corinthians, don't you know that you are a temple of God and his spirit lives in you? If I know that he lives in me, then he must be living in you too, Jesse. And my mother and my daughter and my husband or my, my wife or my son. And so even though she has imperfections, even though he's doing things I don't like, I have to see God within him. And how can I look beyond the humanity of this person? to the divinity of God within him. That has to be a conscious effort. Oops. I lost you, Jesse. I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. About that. Uh, I, I, I love that insight. And, and I think at the same time, that, 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 that is a spectrum. You know what I mean? We can, 
sometimes feel like we're doing really well and, and sometimes we feel like we're like we're not doing that very well at all at all and the thing that i have been thinking about while well, you've been speak, speaking uh, two people uh john the beloved and and the mother mary who did all of all of the chaos of christ crucifixion and death were they did not scatter like the rest of the apostles and disciples they weren't the two, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus they, they stayed there at the cross in the chaos in the suffering and that is something to be to be old for all for all of us to see uh but sometimes sometimes like say say peter or we run away or we, we feel feel guilty guilty that we, uh denied christ three times that's our first hope there and, and then e- even further than that some some of you just cannot grasp or see God in in, in all of this chaos. So I'm just w- just wondering uh, about how we can find those moments of hope amid all of this all of this and suffering, suffering, hope for that indwelling presence, and how can we hold on to that to then help cultivate to fertilize that even more or so. Oh, that's 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 a good question to ask. Um, today, as we're speaking, you and I is the feast of the Ascension. And um, we think of the poor apostles who had to watch Jesus leave them. And now they're stuck with each other. And the spirit had not yet come to them. And so that they really had to struggle, I think. But fortunately, they were waiting with Mary for the fulfillment of his promise. But with regard to um, finding ways to see God in each other and to... Um, be able to move forward in all of this, I think we have to just be aware that each of us is human, that no one of us has all the answers. You know, there's arguments about uh, who's telling us the truth about the coronavirus, and uh, this state is opening up. I'm in Connecticut, and it's one of the last states. We haven't even opened yet. And, and we don't know when we're going to. And so is he doing the right thing, our governor? I wish I lived in another state. But we are where we are. And God has put me in this moment, at this time, not by accident. And there is a message that he has for each one of this, one of us in this coronavirus epidemic, pandemic. Um, I don't know what it is yet. For me but in my quiet moments I need to ask him not why are you doing this but what is it that you want me to learn from this and I can do that by just taking a moment to turn within and know that the Father is there within me Jesus is here the Holy Spirit is here and if I'm quiet enough I can hear what he has to say I might not hear it at this moment, but as long as I'm listening, he is going to answer that question. I can't answer it for you and you can't answer it for me. But I know that if we allow God to work in us and through us, when we come out of this, we're going to be closer than we ever were to God. We'll be closer than we ever were to one another if we remember that we have sheltered in place with God within us. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it but... answers it better than I thought it was going to answer. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing that I, that I find really helps me to focus on something is a mantra of sorts. So, you know, if, if there are times where I'm feeling being doubtful in the, in the Eucharist, feeling doubt, doubt, I'm in the Mass, it's that, uh, Lord, I, I believe my unbelief, you know, types of things. I'm just curious as to, are there, are there any type of mantras like that you would recommend would be good for us to, to just repeat over and over to really help help us send that in our, our mind? Well, there are a few that I use. I often pray, Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I may see your face. I'd love to see what he looks like. I think to myself, if I could just see him for one moment, I'd never do anything wrong again. I'd be transformed. I was actually, I'll tell a little story on myself. I was praying that one morning at Mass, Lord, show me your face. Just show me your face. And in my heart, I heard him say, at communion, I will show you my face. 
I mean, it wasn't a vision or anything, but I heard those words. So I couldn't wait for communion. I want Father to hurry up, bring us to communion. And so I came back from the altar rail and I was kneeling there and I, I said, I'm waiting, Jesus, I'm waiting, Jesus. And suddenly there was a tap on my shoulder. Imagine, right after communion. And I looked and there was a sister who had a question for me. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's a sister who sometimes gets my goat. Um, and I thought, oh, sister, this is communion time. This is communion time. So I answered her question and she went on her way. And I turned back to Jesus and I said, show me. And then I said, did you just show me your face? And I didn't have to answer. And I, I haven't been able to get that out of my mind. I need to see his face. That's what keeps me going. And so I need to look for his face in each person. Um, so that's my mantra, show me your face. And now when I ask for that, I know that he's going to show me who he wants me to be kind to, who he wants me to recognize as my sister or brother. Um, another mantra that I often ask, that I often say is just, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Because he wants to give us the wisdom that we need to handle situations like the pandemic. The fear that we might feel, you know, am I being exposed by someone who's careless? Or have I been somewhere that I shouldn't have been? Am I taking care of myself well enough? There's a lot that we don't know about the virus. So come Holy Spirit, just do in me what you want to do in me so that I can come out of this closer to God and to one another. That, that, that's wonderful. And hopefully, hopefully, if I ask Christ to show me his face, he's not wearing a mask uh, so that, that I can actually <laughs> see what's going, going on there, which sounds, sounds maybe you're the one who put the mask over his, his face in the story, which I think can all relate yeah. to. I think that is, is very relatable. And it goes back to the very beginning about, you know, tr treating everybody as if they were Christ. And I think that's, that's simply wonderful. Uh, what about some, some other prayers or devotionals that you think could really help cultivate this uh, indwelling? Oh, my goodness, the sign of the cross. To make the sign of the cross, um, we do it. Well, I sometimes do it without thinking, you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's a good way to begin a prayer. Um, <clears throat> but it, it is the compendium of the economy of salvation in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I begin my work. In the names of the Trinity, I begin my prayer. In the names of the Trinity, I begin this encounter with a person who might be difficult, or who might be asking more of me than I think I can give. So certainly the sign of the cross. The glory be to the Father is a beautiful prayer, um, reminding us that we want everything we do to be for the glory of the Trinity. Those two prayers are very powerful for me. And short. That's, hey, again, I think that, that's what helped me focus, this is that you have that short you know, you know, petition. In, in fact, one, one of my favorite uh, types of prayers, uh, Teze Day Prayer, because you're kind of this rep uh -huh. of hymns over and over and over again. And I find that, and that if I can my body body that, and that can that can just kind of be habitual at that point, and then mind can start can start to be a more free, and I don't have to worry about my mind racing or wandering because my, my mind's concentrating on that other other thing. So so uh, I think that might be of, of great assistance as well. Uh, another question I have: We talked about about this in the in the beginning, but I'm just curious as to whether or not those who live in a religious religious community have more preparation or experience in dealing with the lifestyle that we're, we're all dealing with, with currently. And, and, and I think so. What, what are some real practical ways that I, could, I can draw from your experience in a religious community? Hmm. Um, were we more prepared than you for, for this? Um, well, actually, it, it, this was a, quite a paradigm shift for those of us in religion. In my community, we have the privilege of having Holy Mass every day because we have a chaplain. And um, he's not afraid to, to come from Mass. 
so that's been a great blessing that so many thousands and thousands and thousands of people have not had. But we've had also to um, find ways to distance socially. We've had to do that. But, it, you know, it's, it's easier, I think, in, in the religious life because, because we're attuned to one another. And I, I have 39 other sisters that I have to worry about. <clears throat> and they have 39 sisters that they have to worry about, too. So we're, we're looking toward the benefit of each other. So when I don't want to wear a mask, I put it on because I have some older sisters here who, need, who, who don't need to get the virus. And when I don't feel like um, keeping six feet away, I owe it to my sisters to do that. So there's that bond of community life, I think, which makes us aware, although we're, sometimes we fail in it, um, it makes us aware of each other. And um, what else? Well, we pray together. We pray together. We have a lot of space between us in the chapel, but um, certainly prayer together, pray, a family that prays together will be able to deal with this. It's hard. You know, it's hard to be angry with somebody that you bring to prayer or somebody that you're praying with. So if I have a grudge against somebody in my family that I've been living with now for nine days, uh, for nine weeks, 24-7, uh, if I pray with that person or for that person, I can't stay mad at him or at her. So those things um, help. The fact that we have the community and the fact that we pray together every day is very powerful and actually people in the domestic church you have that also now you have a community within your house and you can pray together for some that's harder than others but but it, i think it's a strength to draw from absolutely and my, and my question for you today the feast of the ascension of our lord jesus christ uh, uh, I think we can put ourselves in the shoes of those apostles where, again, you, you know, we referenced this earlier, but it feels like, feels like he's leaving, leaving. It feels like he's gone. And, you know, little do we know, I, I guess, guess the people should have known, he, he said he was going to send them the advocate. But, but, but then Pentecost, which we celebrate in a week, we're to celebrate that Holy Spirit that dwells in us as well. And so how can we p pivot from that fear, fear of Christ in us, like we, like we right now, Maybe we feel like God's left us because we have the, sac the sacraments, we have the Eucharist, we don't have reconciliation fully in, in, in a sacramental sense. How to deal with that, with that so that we can keep going forward and then furthermore prepare ourselves to then regain those sacraments? As a community, we pray so often, just about every day, for the people who, who are in that situation, who must feel bereft, who cannot receive the Holy Eucharist, just as you've said. And um, we bring them with us to communion every day, and we bring them to adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. But for those who are experiencing that loss of Jesus, um, his, his, his presence, you're right. It's exactly what the apostles felt. What do we do now? What do we do now? They went to the upper room, and they were together with Mary. They were together with Mary. So we can, we can call upon our mother. She'll never leave us alone. We might have a little harder time now getting in touch with Jesus because it's no longer a local phone call now that he's in heaven. But Mary is a mother who's with us at every moment. So to say, Mary, help me in this time. I need your son. I need your spouse, the Holy Spirit, to lead me through this dark time. And no mother would would uh, refuse to answer that prayer, least of all Mary. It is amazing and such a great answer. Uh, sister, if you wouldn't mind, would you please say a prayer for all of us, us, all that we're going through, those who are having medical issues with the virus, those who get attention but can't get at it because, you, you know, we're, we're, uh, we have a stay-at-home stay -at -home order, all this anxiety we have, depression that we have. Uh, can you say a prayer, prayer for all of us that we that we can uh, be stronger and that we can recognize the indwelling presence? Jesse, I think you just made that prayer yourself. <clears throat> that was beautiful. 
So um, what I'd like to do is to address the Trinity in this prayer and then end with, with your thoughts. Most Holy Trinity, tender Father, beloved Jesus, precious Holy Spirit, we adore you profoundly within us and in every person we encounter this day. We embrace you and we love you. And we thank you for choosing to make of our souls your dwelling place. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may recognize you in your indwelling and so reverence you in one another. Be with us as we struggle in this pandemic with all the losses we have experienced, with all the anxiety we're still experiencing, all the doubts and confusion. You are truth. You cannot deceive us and you will not deceive us. We trust in you and we embrace your presence. We have no other need, no other hope, no other desire but you, most holy God, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sister. And uh, uh, I get you for your, your many, many years being on the board for the Institute of Memory of Life. We hope, we hope to continue to offer, draw from your, your, your experience and your, all, all that you have to offer, years to come, come. and we pray, pray, pray for health and well-being well as well. Again, I'm Jess Weiler for, for the Instagram Religious Life. Thank you very, very much for your time. I hope to talk to you in soon. Thank you for this opportunity, Jesse. It's been God wonderful. Bless. God, God bless, bless you. you.